So this week we're looking at chapter 9 of looking at movies, which is about sound. And uh, we're looking at the case study of the film Gravity, which in the tradition that we've set for this course uh, is here because it won Academy Awards for Best Original Score, it won for Best Sound at the BAFTAs as well, as well by the way, um, and then it also won for Sound Editing and Mixing at the Academy Awards. It, was, it had 10 nominations, won seven, so it's a quality film, it's a prestige picture, um, but the area that it is celebrated for is primarily its sound. Uh, certainly it was um, praised for its use of cinematography, the way in which it pushed the way that uh, films are made with a combination of special effects as well as the positioning of the camera. Um, but we're going to be looking at it for its uh, relationship with sound. And... Uh, Right away, I, I wanted to highlight uh, two of the images from the paratexts of the film. Paratexts are the texts that surround the text that we're looking at. And of course, I'm using the word text here to speak about media. We could also talk about this, um, these as forms of what, sort of intermedial uh, or transmedial conversations. Um, the posters for a film are a form of paratext or transmedia, as are the trailers. But these two posters uh, are, are a great... Um, contrast of the two positions that this film works in where in the one we've got the statement don't let go which we're going to come back around to uh, near the end but that I think is one of the core concepts of this film is letting go like the film you know this poster says don't let go but uh, I don't think that's really the message of the movie um, and we see this wide angle position of ostensibly Ryan's stone being blown away from something. We're not really sure. It's, it's not clear in this particular image, but she's lost in space, as it were. Um, and, uh, and there's that emptiness of the void around her and Earth so very far from where she is. And then in this other image, this really, really close-up shot of Sandra Bullock as Ryan Stone, uh, looking terrified, um, breathing heavily into uh, the faceplate of her helmet, uh, these are these are the two positions that this film often operates in, and these are this is related to the sound. In case you're like, well, this feels like a cinematography thing, uh, this is related to the sound. In that, um, it, sound supports the visuals. If it doesn't, it's not very good sound. I mean, you can have the best sound effects in the world, and if those sa that sound isn't in support of the film, then there's problems with it. Um, now. Music is probably the first thing that we think about when we think about film and sound. We, we say, oh, um, this movie had, uh, you know, really great sound. We're usually referring to the movie's soundtrack. Most people are aware of the soundtrack and less the other aspects of sound. Um, Save to perhaps say that it was, you know, guns don't really make that noise or something like that. Um, but the, 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 the composer for this film, Stephen Price, uh, had a really interesting position. And it was, it, it's reminiscent in some ways of, of, of the um, music for uh, Godzilla um, because uh, Akira Fukube, the uh, the composer for that, did things with his soundtrack that feel very much like they're sound effects, that they are part of the foley of the film. Um, um, foley is when you, you deliberately create sounds in lockstep with the picture. It's not ambient noise that you recorded when you were on location, but rather sounds that are created to convey uh, information in the film. And Ifukube used these giant koto drums to replicate a sense of Godzilla's footfalls, but they were really just part of the music. And Stephen Price's soundtrack operates in this capacity 
at many points um, because we don't hear everything in gravity. One of the first m the things we learn in this film, there's this, this these these uh, words that come up at the beginning of the film talking about how in, in space uh, there's nothing to carry sound, life in space is impossible, there's no oxygen, so you're not, you know, you can't hear anything. And yet, uh, this film has sound. Uh, Alphonse Cuaron, the director of the movie, said that they first wanted to try to do the film without sound and then realized that what they were doing by having no sound in the film other than dialogue was alienating their audience. That sound was necessary to keep the viewer engaged and emotionally connected to what was going on on screen. And so uh, unlike, you know, how our textbook says that um, sound ought to be part of the whole pro uh, process of filmmaking that you, know, you bring a you bring a composer in very early in the process. Stephen Price came in very late in the process, but w became integral in how he would use the musical cues of the film to, in a way, replicate. Uh, sound effects, which takes us all the way back in some sense, not that we've traveled there this semester, but traveling all the way back to the silent era when music, musical scores accompanied the film in place of Foley. Um, in place of all these things, and you know that that, that the music -na 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 could replicate a sense of what should be going on emotionally, and it might feel like something happened in terms of like a sound effect, but it's really just part of the score. And Rod Whitaker, who I quoted in a very early lecture for this course, um, in his book *The Language of Film*, says it is significant that the film has always relied on the totally unrealistic support of background music, which has become so idiomatic that the average filmgoer is unconscious of its presence. And we actually think that films that don't have a score are weird, right? Like halfway through seeing the Blair Witch Project, I'm like, this movie has no music. And people have commented on other movies that are without a score. Um, no Country for Old Men comes to mind. People have talked about, you know, the absence of, of music in that. Um, M. Night Shyamalan hardly uses uh, scores in his early films. He was like really remiss about using music because he felt that it was unnecessarily con uh, manipulative and that, you know, really the films about visual language and music doesn't matter as much. And he had his mind changed on that when um, he made the film uh, Unbreakable. But but um, this idea that, that we're unconscious of, of music's presence in a movie. I mean, we know it's there, right? Especially if the score is one of John Williams's more bombastic ones. Uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? Dun, 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 we can hum along. Or Star Wars. Ba, ba, da, 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 and we are getting the sense of what this movie is about. Um, movies like Moulin Rouge, the score is front and center because it's a musical. But... Lots of movies we're not really aware that the music's there. It's just, it's part of the fabric of the film. And, and once we're into the narrative, even in a movie as with, with, with a really bombastic score, we get lost in the, in, in the, in the synthesis of all that content. Whitaker goes on to say, it is precisely because background music operates on a level other than the conscious that it can affect the audience member so subtly and strongly. I think Price's score for Gravity is an incredible example of how the musical um, score, the cues, can support the visuals in really powerful ways without becoming front and center. Like you're aware that it's there. Um, you're aware that there are these, these quasi synthesized sounds because this is not an, even though it sounds like an electronic soundtrack, it's actually a lot of uh, organic sounds being processed. Uh, like someone um, doing that thing where you run your finger on wet glasses, playing a bunch of different glasses. Those are organic sound flesh on liquid on glass. That's still tactile and it's about touch, right? It's fascinating to me that they used uh, a glass a musician, a musician who plays different forms of glass instruments because that is such a tactile 
instrument. You might say, well, all instruments are ultimately tactile, Dr. Pershawn. Sure, but when you're playing uh, even the piano, there is a distance between the, the, the flesh hitting the key and the hammer hitting the, uh, the, piano, the piano string. Um, the, that, that's not what they're called, but you know what I mean. <laughs> the piano... Um, dang it, I don't know what they're called, but I'm going to call them piano strings. Um, and, and, and making that noise that a piano does, or an electronic keyboard especially, there's a lot of distance between the tactile and the produced sound, whereas like these, these glass, uh, this, this glass performer, is th that's real flesh, you know, right down, and it's part of why the sound is occurring. And that's fascinating to me because the, this entire film uh, its sound is built around the idea of vibrations and touch. Um, and so the, the music uh, echoes that in so many ways, not only because of that tactile element with that glass performer, but also um, in the low frequency rumbles that Price produces to signal danger at various points uh, and even musical cues that are like standing in for explosions and whatnot right what is sound what is sound when we talk about sound in a film what do we what do we mean because i mean you know people obviously think of music but there's more to it than just the music there's more to it than just the dialogue i suppose people would think very quickly sound is about dialogue um, and I've heard people criticize movies because there wasn't enough dialogue and I'm like, dialogue is not even necessary for a film to work. You can have a film without dialogue. Uh, if you ever get a chance, I highly recommend seeing Robert Redford in All Is Lost. Uh, that's a movie where there's next, there is no dialogue. There is, there are voices, but there's no dialogue and that film works. It absolutely works. It's an incredible piece of, of cinematic art. Um, but right away, we want to say, with regards to gravity, that silence is part of the soundtrack of a film. It has to be. There was a bass player by the name of Stu Ham, and he said of, of playing rock and roll that it's not about the notes you play, it's about the notes you don't play. It's about leaving the gaps and the space for the dynamics to occur in a song. And I think the same is true for film, for film narrative. Uh, again, coming back to Godzilla, uh, there's this wonderful scene where there's roughly, um, I think about a, over a minute of silence and just characters walking around in front of the camera in a um, medium wide shot. And that there's all this quiet and then boom, the Kodo drum that signals Godzilla's arrival. And it has this sense of the dynamic that really gets your attention. And I think gravity does an incredible job of playing with silence as a as a motif in the film uh, early on in the movie um george clooney as uh, kowalski asking um uh, dr ryan stone uh, sandra bullock's character uh you know what do you like best up here and she says it's the silence um, she really loves the silence and there's so many silences in this film again Quaron wanted the movie to be more silent than it is but realized that that wasn't possible and so instead wanted to create sort of these ambient textures the amb these ambient um, auditory textures to replace that silence to convey a certain sense of emotionality and you, all you have to do is go look at the shot or the scene that I've, I've got in this shot where we've got George Clooney looking up at the earth and he's reflecting on the view and the music that comes into the back background there is not ostentatious it's not it's not overwhelming what's happening it's it's there in support but there are many moments in this movie where the film does get very very quiet and so silence is part of the soundtrack of a film the gaps the the spaces that are left for that sense of dynamic uh talking laughing singing music and the oral effects of objects and setting and the way that this movie starts out with that fade in this very slow uh fade in and it comes right after dead silence there's this crescendo of music in the opening sequence with the sound the the words about there's nothing in space to carry sound and life is in space is impossible it's like Bwah. 
and then whew, it's gone and there's perfect silence and we just see the earth and very slowly there's this fade in of Kowalski's uh, you know um, voice and uh, we've got Ed Harris uh, I love that they got Ed Harris to play Mission Control because he had done it before uh, in another famous movie about space and while we're on the subject let's just let's just stop shall we let's stop and i will veer off in a rabbit trail because this being the last class um of this you know that i'm delivering lecture content for this course i i i'm i I owe myself a rabbit trail of this nature this movie is classified in many places as science fiction and i want to say as a scholar of science fiction that that's utter crap this is not a science fiction movie. It does not posit any really serious novums. There's nothing, there's no new tech that the movie is interested in. It's not following those things. It's not even, it's not even ultimately the sort of social science fiction that writers like Ursula K. Le Guin did where they weren't really interested in um, explaining the physics uh, of their tech. This is just a movie that happens in space. It is. In, and and it it doesn't um, it doesn't do anything that really positions it as a science fiction film. But because it's a movie that's in space, it's like well, then it's immediately it's science fiction, and that's crap. Because if that's true, then arguably the right stuff was science fiction, and you're like, well, but those were real people in the right stuff. They were talking about the real space program. And my response is yes, but in a fictionalized way at some level, because as I argued earlier in the semester, any film brings a sort of fictional element to the narrative. But even though Dr. Ryan Stone and Kowalski aren't real people, this movie isn't a, like there's there's nothing here that is speculative in terms of the future, technology, society. It's a character film. It's about Dr. Ryan Stone. And so I think to call it science fiction is just utterly remiss. And this isn't me being a gatekeeper and being like, you keep that out of my science fiction. It didn't have enough aliens or something like, no, gosh, no. Uh, I would readily admit that a movie like The Martian, which is also about an astronaut in a survival situation, is a science fiction film. But this is not. This is not. And... And, uh, and, and I'll come back to a, another beef that I have with the way that this film has been um, spoken about in, in a little bit, but that'll be more related to sound. Um, but this, this opening sequence where we see the Earth and we hear Ed Harris at Mission Control and we get, you know, Clooney as Kowalski talking and we've got the crew talking in the background and there's all these transistorized voices and that's important because that changes in just a little bit all these these transistorized voices um, and and the that 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 play of talking and laughing and singing and in this case music as well right uh, we get it all in the opening sequence of gravity and I think back to little women and I think back to the way in which those ad-libbed conversations had to still be able to punch out the important conversation without um, feeling uh, contrived and that the opening sequence here feels like a relatively realistic conversation with Clooney continually going back to his you know ridiculous stories that he wants to tell that he's already told a hundred times to uh, to everyone who's on his uh, missions with him so that's another aspect of sound right sound as as, as dialogue uh, as laughter and we should just note very quickly that a lot of the dialogue almost all dialogue in films is done with ADR they record it after the fact so they they record it while they're filming but they also go back and the actors redo that dialogue um watching their own performance in a studio and it's uh it's a apparently it's a skill set that if you're going to be uh, a, a film actor you better have uh, you better be able to match your performance to what you gave the first time um so that they can they can work on your stuff in adr uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the adr in just a moment um, what is sound? It operates on both a physical and a psychological level. So there's obviously the physical sense that if somebody, you know, pokes the side of a helmet, it's going to go punk, right? And so we get those noises. Um, and those are really the only noises we ever get in this film are, are the physical sounds 
Only if the character was touching something would, would you hear it as fully as sound effect, as a sound in the diegesis, which we'll come to in just a moment. Um, but then there's also the psychological sounds, which are conveyed through the score and through these ambient textures that Queron uh, wanted his, his, sound, um, his sound designers to bring to the table. And I got a quote here from Glenn Kaiser of the Dolby Institute uh, from IndieWire.com where he says, the very traditional use of sound is to think of it almost like a proscenium in a live theater, the proscenium arch, the stage that you sit in front of and you watch characters on. Our focus is on what's happening under that proscenium on the stage, and that's him saying what's on the screen is almost like the proscenium, uh, the stage where the actors are performing. The work that Skip, and he's speaking about one of the people who worked on sound design for this film, is doing is shattering that and encouraging a much deeper engagement with the senses by a much more passionate use of sound to fill the entire space and put the audience in the space that the story is happening and give them the experience of being in that space with those characters having the experience that they're having. And I have this image, a very, very close up shot, this really tight close up shot of Sandra Bullock's face in the helmet. Um, and you may remember if you've, you, you know, watching the movie that the camera comes in towards her after she's flown off into space. So we get that opening sequence with lots of different voices and lots of different sounds. And then the crisis occurs and debris hits their ship and the cr some of the crew are killed and she's thrown off into space by herself. And all we get initially is her breathing and her panic. And the camera keeps coming in closer and closer to her. And then it goes right through the glass of her helmet. And then it's inside there. And at that moment, the sound changes. You go back and rewatch the film. She's transistorized in the sequence immediately before this. And just a quick note about the editing of this film. The first shot, even though it is probably composite work um, that's made to look like a single shot, um, is probably some digital compositing going on there. It's 13 minutes long. That shot is 13 minutes long and the sound is consistent throughout. What do I mean by consistent? I don't mean it's not moving through the surround sound because Lord knows in this movie there's a lot of that moving around in the surround sound and panning back and forth. Queron loves that stuff. He does it a ton in Children of Men. Um, but this was, this was about uh, Queron saying we, that he wanted to push the shot to its ultimate consequence. And I have to quote him on that because I love that quotation so much. I love that statement, pushing the shot to its ultimate consequence that, you know, they wouldn't just do a long take for the, for the, you know, you know, just for, for the ostentatious joy of having said, oh, we did a 13 minute shot, but because he wanted to push the shot to its ultimate consequence. And when you, when you rewatch that, it, it, it you'll, you'll be like, wow, I, you know, at least I felt that way. I was like, wow, I did not realize I was watching a long take because it felt a little bit like the way that the camera was moving produced a sort of edit of sorts. But through that entire sequence, that entire shot, and this is where a shot and a sequence are, 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 are the same thing in this particular case. Um, this uh, Stone's voice comes through transistorized. Everyone is speaking to mission control. Everyone is hearing this transistorized and we're sort of sitting in this omniscient point of view. And then when she's thrown out in a space and, and we return to her and the camera closes in on her, we adopt her point of view in this six minute sequence. We're inside her helmet and, but her voice is already not transistorized right before that. It's, it's a sort of like, uh, the flat EQ that we normally hear um, dialogue with in most films. And then it moves inside the helmet and the nature of the sound changes, her voice changes so that it sounds like it's inside the helmet. And they did work with this. The sound production people uh, would do recordings inside of helmets just to get a sense of like, well, what would that sound like? And what would we have to do to replicate it? And they do that here. They take her dialogue and it, it feels like we're inside the helmet with her for a few moments. And so this is what Kaiser's talking about, this guy from the Dolby Institute, uh, which is all about sound. If you don't know what the Dolby Institute is, um, it's uh, it's 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 about you know the Dolby. It was is one of the, the, the concepts of sound going way back. I can't get into that right now, 
that's a, that's a rabbit trail I don't want to do today. Um, but, uh, the experience of being in that space with those characters, having the experience that they are having, that's what Queron and his sound design people do by bringing the camera and the sound inside, uh, Stone's helmet becomes psychological sound at that point. It's not just um, physical sound, although there is that aspect to it. Like, really, we couldn't hear her outside her helmet, so it's not like we're floating in space. We are ha we're in her point of view, as it were. So this, this is what sound is. Let's talk about sound design. Now, as I said earlier, your textbook says sound should be integral to all three phases of film production, pre-production, production, and post-production. And sound design certainly was. The music wasn't, but sound design was on uh, Quaron's mind and his uh, sound team's mind uh, from a very early point. Um, Glenn Fremantle was the sound editor slash sound designer. What does a sound editor do? Sound editors compile, create, and assemble everything the audience hears on screen, including dialogue. Now, they don't craft the music, but they are in charge of, you know, how that's going to interface with all these, these other aspects. So they compile, they create, they assemble everything the audience hears on screen, including dialogue. So, you know, compile and create. Well, you might record real sound and then process that. You might just, you know, record the sound that was on, on uh, location. And then there's other instances where you create the sound because there is no sound for the thing that you're, you're working with. The sound design for Star Wars is filled with uh, Foley creating sounds and in the, in this case not even sounds that we've heard before like you know cornflakes for walking on snow this is going and hitting a high tension wire um with a metal object so that you can get the pew, pew, the pew pew sounds of star wars and so that's what the sound editor does they compile they create they assemble everything the audience hears on screen so they're in charge of making the world of the film in sound and then the sound mixer decide at, decide at what levels those sounds will coexist, not force. For those who are looking at the video online, force sounds. I, I screwed up. There's a typo. Um, it was bound to happen. Sound mixers decide at what levels those sounds will coexist with each other and the musical score calibrating that ratio to what? Enhance verisimilitude. And let's remember verisimilitude is not reality. Verisimilitude is the appearance of reality within the rules that the film has set. So if the film is a ludicrous, bombastic, over-the-top comedy, then it's going to have very different rules than if it's a quasi-realistic film set in space. Calibrating that ratio to enhance verisimilitude and emotional impact. Because at the end of the day, that's what a film is trying to do is impact us emotionally. So when a gun goes off in a movie, does it sound like a real gun? Uh, no, almost never does. But does it feel like the sound that a gun makes when it's in your hand or when it's next to your head? Potentially, right? Or at least it makes us feel like we think we'd feel, right? Because films aren't, they're not about truth. They're not about facts. They're about emotional impact. They're about narrative. They're about telling a story and telling it well. Um, and knives, swords, I've spoken about this, I think, this semester where... Um, you know, someone, someone's got a, a blade on another person. We were just watching uh, Avengers Endgame the other day, my family and I. And um, this scene with Hawkeye and this, uh, this, this mob boss that he's been trying to track down. And they're having a sword fight. And there's a point at which they have blades at each other's throats. And the blades are making this ringing noise like that playing on glass sound is. That, that high woo. And in real life, swords don't make that sound. In real life, you take a sword out and it doesn't make any sound other than the sound that it makes when it comes out of its sheath. And then it makes a sound when it hits another blade. And I've done uh, stage sword fighting and you have to have stage swords to make them sound like we think swords are supposed to sound like. Because when a sword hits another sword, it sounds like clank. It's really, it's really um, anticlimactic. It's really disappointing. But if you have a hollow metal blade, then it goes clang. So if you're going to do like a recreation of a sword fight and you want it to sound really good, then you get hollow swords and they go clang, not clink. 
So it's about verisimilitude and emotional impact, how we think things sound. Um, this comes down to the, the, the hanging up of a phone in movies. Why do we still hear a click when people hang up phones? In the real world, there's no click anymore. There's just, and there's no like, boo. There's just somebody went through a tunnel and you lost them on the cell phone and you're sitting there going, hello, hello, uh, hello, right? Tons of sounds in films that have no, no relationship to reality. The, the way that like someone to pull a gun out and they just pull the gun out and it makes a cocking sound. They, they don't do that. They only ch -ch -ch when you do that. So there's this, you know, punches, punches don't sound like they do in movies in real life. So this is about what we feel as an audience and what we, the, the movie is trying to present to us in terms of a uh, fictional world. I, I just want to jump back to that last slide. Uh, Nina Hartstone, the supervising dialogue ADR editor of this movie, said that she started hyperventilating at some point um, because she was breathing along with Sandra Bullock in her performances. That Sandra had to come into Bullock had to come into the um, into the studio to record. <laughs> And all of her, you know, these these moments of panic, and so when she when when Nina Hartstone was working on on that content, uh, she she herself got a sense of like panic. So we just think about like be reviews that I've seen for this film where people are like, "This movie is nothing but this woman breathing heavily for an hour and a half," and I'm like, "Uh huh," and. See, because that dismissive thing is you stopped watching the movie that got made. You went with an expectation, probably based upon the fact that you thought you were going to a science fiction movie, and you got there and it turned out to be this other thing. It turns out to be a survival film that's really ultimately character-based. And, and you oh, it's just Sandra Bullock breathing heavily and having panic. And it's like, yes, 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 that's what this movie is. Now you need to watch that film and not the film you thought you were going to see. I get salty at the end of the semester, I guess. Uh, sound design. Film sound has become more innovative and complex, as has the role of sound designers. So not only do we have these roles, but they become more complex as technology has advanced. And Lucas, Star, uh, Star Wars uh, creator George Lucas, is responsible for a lot of that push, that initial push, where for the longest time you went to a movie and it was in stereo. And George Lucas came along and he said, let's see what else we can do. And we got THX out of that, um, this surround sound uh, approach. And more and more theaters became uh, outfitted with it. And I, I remember seeing uh, the, the movie um, Transformers in a tiny little theater with a mono speaker behind the screen. And when one of the Decepticons, the evil robots, blew out the windows in a tower, uh, control tower on a, at an airport, it was really like, meh. It was like, Kiss. And then I saw it again when I was in Edmonton. I got back home and we went and saw it again in a, in a really, really great theater with a really, really great digital sound system. And when that happened, there was this sub this subwoofer kind of blah underneath all of that. So it was, it was like, and you felt it in your seat. And the provenance of that goes all the way back to George Lucas pushing the boundaries of sound with THX. And you used to go to theaters and they would tell you, you're in a special theater with a special sound system, THX. Uh, now you don't get those as much. Almost all theaters are equipped with all of that gear. And lots of people's home systems are as well. Uh, one of my great disappointments in learning about the sound of gravity is that I didn't see this movie in the theaters. I saw this movie on Blu-ray or on you know digital, and I don't have a surround sound system. I have I have some nice speakers. They have great response, but they're not surround sound. And this movie does stuff with surround that I am desperate to see here in a in in the right environment um they not only were moving the elements of like sound effects the, the elements of foley and dialogue all over the 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 theater by mixing it in this surround environment but they did it with the soundtrack as well so the music there are certain levels of the music and this is not done very often the music is just sort of 
here it's usually here and here it's in your left and your right but it's not moving around the theater and apparently that was the case it was moving around the theater just some of the musical cues would be uh shifting to, to throughout the surround sound um uh technology which i think is fantastic so as technology moves along we you know sound changes the way that we can mix it now uh, the way that we can play with it in the digital environment. That changed everything for sound design. You could do all sorts of stuff that you'd never done before and do it with greater and greater ease. I mean, like even me producing my work for my students, I can drop in effects anywhere into the audio with the click of a mouse. Two, two or three clicks and there's reverb happening on my voice. So... That's amazing technology, but what they're doing with this in film is like all sorts of layers and messing around, or as they put it in one of the articles that I read about about gravity, they referred to it as futzing with the the sounds. Even though they would like they recorded strings, they messed around with them. Stephen Price was like, nope, can't just be regular strings. I've got to I've got to do something with this to augment it to make it match the film. A film's sound is potentially as expressive as its images, this says your textbook. And, you know, there's lots of movies where this is true, but it's fascinating once you know what was going on with the sound design for Gravity to go back and rewatch the movie. Once you learn that the, the raison d'etre of what they were trying to do was to um, mimic a sense of touch... That, that, that every time a character touches something, that's when you're going to get sound. If they, have, if they have a connection to it, then we can give it some sort of sound in the film, be that the musical cue or the foley. Then that's the point at which that can happen. And so this shot where um, one of Bullock's lifeboats is flying along the solar panels and cutting them all up, the way that the sound interacts at that point makes this shot far more compelling. We are caught up in, it in in a way that we aren't if all we do is see the image. I, at several points this semester, took the time, actually even before, I, I remember doing this in the summer, doing the dishes, had my headphones on, listening to gravity. Not watching it, just listening to it. I just wanted to pay attention to the sound. And then I watched it without the sound on. Not the entire film, but I watched a good chunk of it without the sound on. And you do that. Go, go, and, go and take a moment to appreciate some sequence of the film without its uh, sound in. And then go back and, and just listen to it. And then watch both together. That's a way of studying how sound is used in a film. And, and what's fascinating to me is that I in some ways feel as emotionally overwrought when the debris first hits um, the the crew of this this space shuttle because of the sound as I do as when I watch the film in fact I would go so far as to say that I think the sound is integral to that sequence being so powerful we're going to talk about that a little bit more in just a bit Image and sound are co-expressible, says your textbook. And the sound design team, Stephen Price as well, as the composer, talked about how when Bullock is doing these free-fall spins and we're seeing the planet keep coming into view in the background as she spins around, the music and the sound design is mirroring that. It, again, in a, in, a, in a surround sound environment, it would be moving around the theater. But they, they mimic it a little bit with the stereo panning. Um, there's a sort of woo-woo-woo uh, oscillating that goes on if you don't have a full, uh, you know, Dolby sound surround or some other form of sounds, uh, surround sound, sound surround, surround sound. Um, and but but you don't get the full impact sadly and my students certainly won't with our amazing uh fidelity from uh from our uh our our e-reserves but it we're so thankful that we have e-reserves to give us our films when we need to study them but thankfully this movie is also on netflix so if you're you want to get a really good sense of what the sound is like uh check it out there um describing film sound how do we talk about sound in film 
we can talk about perceptual characteristics like pitch. Pitch is, is it high or is it low? And Stephen Price's score has both of these things. We have these low, uh, low frequency rumbles and then these sort of shrieking highs at various points and they're a little bit distorted. Um, loudness, how intense is this? How present is it in the, in the mix? And people talk about how frustrated they are with the way that Christopher Nolan has been doing sound in some of his films where he buries the dialogue in the score and the Foley and that's the point. Like it's, it's, it's unreasonable to assume that they screwed it up and then it got to the theater and was just, well, that was a mistake. Um, that's not how films are made today. They know what they're doing by the time they get to the theater, unless it's like an indie sort of thing. No, no, no. Um, Nolan intends for the, for the soundtrack to overwhelm at that point. The dialogue is apparently incidental. We don't need to know what they're saying. We have put far too high a premium on dialogue. And that's one of those hangovers, going back to the very beginning of this course, is one of those hangovers from the way that we study narrative. We study it from the novel. And so we're like, what do they say? And how do these words matter? And how much do words matter in film? Less. I mean, they're, they're still important, but we need to be paying attention to the whole soundscape and the visuals. There's, there's a ton to be paying attention to, all this cinematic language. So we've got loudness, volume or intensity. Is it loud or soft? And then quality, finally. Uh, the timber, the texture, the color. Talking about textures, uh, the way that so much of the, the textures of the sound in this film are, are they're made mechanical, made technological, uh, a sort of loss of the humanity there. Uh, there are instances where that's not the case, but there's a lot of, of processing that's, that's, that's happened here. And so the quality of the sound tells us something about like how we're supposed to perceive it. Um, I think about, uh, again, it's just that, that low frequency rumble has this sense of almost like industrial music, the pedigree of, of synthesizer music, even though it's, it's just processed um, sounds, pro pro processed organic sounds. Um, and then finally, fidelity. How close is it to the real sound? Well, I've already talked a ton about this today. Um, does it matter? Does it matter if that's what it really sounds like? I remember creating Foley for one of the movies that I made when I was a kid. And it was a, it was a, like a, an old uh, printer in an office chunking out, well, it wasn't old at the time. It was cutting edge technology and it was chunking out uh, paper. And I didn't have that thing in the room where I was doing the recording. So I grabbed an IBM typewriter, plugged it in and just hit enter over and over again. The chug -goo, chug -goo, chug -goo, chug -goo, and it makes this chunk, 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 chunk sound. It looked perfect. It was exactly, exactly what it needed to be. Was it actually the sound? No, but it looked like it was. It was, it was perfect in that respect. Uh, I would always blow it though with gunshots because it'd be like guy with a small pistol and I would use like the sound of a 50 caliber rifle going off. It was just explosive. It was ridiculous. Um, most of the gunshots in Die Hard and the punches in Die Hard, the movie uh, with Bruce Willis, the Christmas movie with Bruce Willis, um, no fidelity to those to, to the real thing. Um, Skip Leavesay, who was one, of, who was the re-recording mixer on Gravity, said, "You're finding components that aren't literal, aren't literal, but that heighten the subjective experience." The subjective experience of where my attention needs to be to some degree, like when Hawkeye pulls his sword out, I need to focus on where it is, that it's near the guy's neck. And that ee, ringing sound, that's metallic. We think of it as a metallic ringing sound, but it's actually glass. Um, now my, my, my eye goes where it needs to because of what I'm hearing. It's a component that you don't understand, but it helps deliver the dramatic idea. And the image that I have here is when the debris first hits the shuttle and the shot begins with Kowalski's point of view looking out towards where the debris is going to be coming and then it goes zooming past and the sound mirrors or echoes that move that camera moves it shoots by uh, the sound does as well and incidentally it apparently also moves in the surround sound in the same direction which I think is absolutely incredible now does space debris even have a sound no, but for fidelity reasons, it's not a sound effect. It's part of the musical score, but it gives that sense of Foley. It gives that sense of sound effects. 
Sources, that's another way that we can describe film sound. Where is it coming from? Is it diegetic sound? Is it non-diegetic sound? What's the difference between these things? Diegetic sound is sound that's in the film world. Dialogue. Clicking of little buttons. We've got an image here of Dr. Ryan Stone in the last of the lifeboats that she finds um, on the, uh, the Chinese uh, space station. And she's speaking to this person on earth she doesn't know where he is or where he's from they don't speak the same language he's got dogs there um it's re revealed in a deleted scene that this is uh, uh someone who is an aboriginal person in the arctic circle and that's who she's speaking to he's got a short wave i guess and so we get um the mix of his voice is diegetic she can hear him so obviously he's real but she doesn't hear stephen price's score Scores are almost always non-diegetic. Although occasionally the movie will play with it where they'll bring, they'll, 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 they'll mess with the score. And we get a little bit of both in terms of music, at least, when it comes to diegetic versus non-diegetic in this movie because of George Clooney playing all his country music through everyone's uh, helmets. And so music in this film is both diegetic and non-diegetic. It's diegetic when it's Clooney playing country, it's non-diegetic when it's Stephen Price's score. And then we get on-screen versus off-screen. Here, Sandra Bullock is on-screen. Her mysterious uh, companion as she speaks, and they howl together in a scene that... You know, this is another one of those movies that never fails to make me cry. Multiple times. This movie guts me. Um, and gets me. Uh, we've got on-screen versus off-screen. And how does that affect the scene? How does that affect the narrative? And then we've got internal versus external. Sometimes the sounds are things that only the person can hear. I think immediately of like when I, I'd use a lot of gun examples, which says that I watch a lot of action films, but I'm thinking of Mad Max Fury Road. When a gun goes right off near um, Max's head at one point, uh, the, the, there's the sound of that ringing that happens right after a really, really loud uh, sound and obviously that is only Max's perspective um, and we also have movies where you know people are hearing voices in their heads like uh, Stranger Than Fiction and not everybody hears the voice only one character does so it's internal versus external sound and how is you know how does that affect the narrative we want to think about those 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 things we want to think about rhythm rhythm isn't just for editing Rhythm is also for sound. I talked about rhythm earlier on with the silence in that scene in Godzilla, followed by the Kodo drums pounding. We get the rhythm of loud versus soft, right? Just the, there's a whole bunch of different rhythms that we can get loud versus soft, sometimes distorted versus, you know, something more uh, euphonic, something more pleasing or harmonic to the ear. Uh, the juxtaposition of those extremes can craft a rhythm but i'm using those as examples um because they're so because they're extreme and so we can really see the rhythm we've got rhythmic extremes it's easier for us to be aware of and then we can look for the more subtle rhythms that come from other mixes of how audio is being used so sound can add rhythm by accompanying movement on the screen. So if it's a chase scene, it's dun 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 dun. I have a friend who, whenever we would start to run, if we were like we were like late for the bus or something like that, we'd start running, and he'd go dun 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 dun. He would give us a soundtrack to accompany our running, um, or when juxtaposed against movement, slowing it down, coming in for the kiss, and the sound can mirror those things. Um, montage of sounds, a mix of sounds from multiple sources of diverse quality level and placement that can be orchestrated to create rhythm. We get a little bit, we get a lot of chaos in that opening sequence. A little bit at first, just all these different voices, but that intensifies and builds. I mean, you want to talk about a, a sound crescendo, rewatch that sequence, because once that debris comes in, it gets bananas in terms of the montage of sounds. And this instance in the film where Stone is moving from the inferno that the International Space Station has become to close the door and just that moving from to the silence is a moment of, of sound rhythm, the rhythm of sound. That's not just like the rhythm of the night or anything like that. Um, nobody could, nobody, it's funny because I'm, I, I, you know, I'm aware that like some people are going to experience this seeing me and some people are going to be hearing me. I was dancing. I was grooving. I was getting my groove on for a little while there. 
Um, and then we've got continuity. Sound creates continuity over editing. And it's because of ADR, recording the dialogue later on, that this is, this is feasible. Because if you just took the sound from the location, it would be very choppy. It would change in its, its uh, quality. The quality of that sound would change depending on where the microphone was, where the camera was. And you wouldn't be able to maintain consistency. So ADR, recording the audio after the fact, allows for a consistency of sound, a continuity of, of the audio, of the, the quality of that audio. And music bridges scenes that have intense edits. Um, the Can Can sequence from Moulin Rouge, ridiculously intense. And yet the music overlaps all those crazy edits and and gives it this sense of continuity makes it a whole so sound glues the film together and makes editing more invisible than it already is editing is invisible enough to begin with and if you see sort of found footage films you get a really good sense of how the sound changes and sometimes they're just they're they're, they're manufacturing that difference just to give a greater sense of the verisimilitude of this is this was a real you know video that we found in the woods but a movie like this we get this frantic last scene, this spectacular climactic re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. So many different sounds. And there are ways in which that's a little choppy. If you rewatch this sequence, the sound changes from shot to shot to give us the sense that the camera is closer or further away from the station as it, as it goes up in flames or... Um, of the of the pod as it ejects and 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 comes down to earth but the music the musical cue is this straight straight arrow that moves through the whole sequence and allows it to feel seamless even amidst that chaos there's a continuity there so we get these wonderful bits of overlapping sound also known as sound bridges And that's sound. That's sound in film. Sound gluing everything together. Making the, the, the edits and the cuts and all these diverse elements come together. Uh, and I think that music does that in a way that um, changes the way that, that, that we perceive a movie. I have in the past taken sequences of film that have no music and put music to them. And the difference in the way that that becomes received by the audience is considerable. To go from a, a, from a scene where there's a really, really great performance and there's some really, really great cinematography going on, and then you bring in some music that matches that mood and it amplifies, it amplifies what's going on. We reach the end of our course with sound. It's the last step in our journey of cinematic language. And I want to close out our discussion of cinematic language and film narrative by bringing those things together. Because while we talked about narrative early in the semester, we, we haven't talked about it necessarily as clearly in the last few lectures i've focused on the technical aspects of film and i recently came across a, a statement by thomas m sipos i think that's that how you pronounce that um, from a book called horror film aesthetics where sipos looks at all the different features of cinematic language and and sees how horror films use them in particular he has this little this tiny little chapter about pragmatic aesthetics, and in it he says, if a technical element in a film serves the story, characters, or themes, then that technical aspect works aesthetically. If a technical element in a film serves the story, characters, or themes, then that technical aspect works aesthetically. Does it support the film, or is it just an ostentatious camera move? 
does it support the film or are they just doing some sort of frantic edit because they can and it's cool and it's hip and it's what all the really you know cool kids with music videos are doing is does it serve the film or are they throwing that special effect in there just because they can did we need it did we need that effect do we need to w look at that effect for as long as we did does it serve the story characters or themes so now that we know what cinematic language is we can start asking the question, does it serve the story, the characters, or the themes? And something that those of you who are just following this as a podcast or on YouTube could not have experienced is my conversation, the ongoing conversation with my students from the very first week of class in our discussion boards, where we have been probing this question. Not overtly, I didn't come out the gates because as I said, I didn't have this quotation in my arsenal. I mean, I knew that that was what I was doing, but this summarizes that concept so nicely. Does the feature of cinematic language serve the story, the characters, or the themes? And at various points throughout the semester, my students have said, no, in this particular case, it doesn't. Or yes, in this particular case, it absolutely does. Or in some cases, they would say, I don't really like this part, what was going on there. And another student would come along and say, hey, maybe this is what they were trying to do. And they're doing that by looking at cinematic language, looking at the cinematic language and asking the question, does it serve the story, the characters or the themes? So coming back to sound and gravity, I was so fascinated to discover that they were using this idea of vibrations of touch for as the basis for how they would do sound design in this film because that is i think one of the governing themes of this movie and approaches like neil degrasse tyson uh, coming in and punching holes in the, the, you know, did they fact check all their stuff? Is this how astronauts actually act in outer space? I don't give a shit. And you shouldn't either. And Neil deGrasse Tyson, I get what he's doing. He's like, you know, he's popularizing science and I love that. So carry on. But we need to stop doing that to film. Stop treating it like it's a documentary. Stop treating every movie like it's realistic or whatever it is that you want it to be. We come with a set of expectations, but once we're in the theater, we sort of have to recalibrate those expectations and see the movie that's being shown, not the one we wish we were seeing. So like if I give a really, really great review to Avengers Endgame, somebody might go, well, I didn't like it because realism. And I'm like, what? No, verisimilitude. Take your realism and go down the street. Verisimilitude within the context of the film where superheroes exist. Now let's evaluate the film based upon that diegesis, that criteria. So someone might walk into this movie and think, oh, it's science fiction, no lasers, no aliens, sucks. Someone else, a Neil deGrasse Tyson or someone like that might go, that's not actually how they do that in space. But this is not a documentary. It's not even the movie The Right Stuff. It's not Apollo 13. It's a fictional tale in space. It's a survival movie, but it's ultimately a character film. It's ultimately about Dr. Ryan Stone and her inability to let go. So that poster at the beginning, don't let go. She has to. She has to let go. She has to let go of her past. She has to move on. She has to let go of the sorrow and the grief that she's carrying around for years because of the death of her daughter. This tragic, senseless death. And the tragic, senseless deaths of all the people who die in this movie because they don't die for any higher purpose. They're not saving the planet out there. They're just installing some new software and then a bunch of them die. And Stone and Kowalski in this shot where she's holding on to that tether and he says, you got to let me go because otherwise she's going to come with him. You got to let me go is a character moment. And, and, and so often people are like, well, I'm sure she could have such and such, but she didn't. She didn't. So you have to stop thinking about the movie that you wish you were watching. Well, if I had been in space with George Clooney, I would never have let him go some other movie you need to bankroll that go make it 
But how about this movie? What's going on in this movie? Look at this wide shot with this really, really long, tangled, whatever that cable is. Sandra Bullock's got one, you know, half of her foot left inside of it, and Kowalski's out at the other end. And he says, let go. That shot says everything about what this movie's about. And then when we take that back to the idea that touch and vibration were in the sound design, I'm like, what? Because to touch, to have contact, right? And she hasn't been able to let go of that, that past event. Again, when she tries to leave uh, the International Space Station on the lifeboat and it's all tangled up, can't get loose, got to let go, got to cut loose, got to gotta get away from that. So many moments of her holding rungs as she pulls herself down, interior spaces, exterior spaces. It's all about being able to grab onto something, something that feels solid, something that's there. And yet for her to get back to earth, we are regularly reminded by these wide camera angles that for her to get back to earth sooner or later, she's going to have to let go of these spaces. She cannot rely upon the solidity of any of these space stations. She can't rely on the solidity that she feels uh, of Kowalski's character. There were some people who, who, who were like, oh, George Clooney, he's just too smooth. No, he's solid. He's supposed to be a solid character because if he's panicking too, this is no longer a movie about Dr. Ryan Stone needing to let go. Now it becomes a movie about Kowalski potentially not being someone you should grab onto, but he is. He is someone she can rely on to, someone he, she can grab onto. And at the very end of the film, when the Chinese space station is exploding and her uh, lifeboat comes loose, it's this really long piece initially, and then that explodes too, and now it's an even smaller piece, and there's pieces flying off of it as everything's just coming loose, letting go. And the technical aspects of this film, based in sound, the idea of touch, that touch is consistently the foundation of the sound in this movie. And then it's the thing that the rest of the film is doing is gorgeous. That's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about cinematic language and understanding the formal elements of film so that we can do a better job of analyzing it. Thanks for coming along on this journey. I hope that cinematic language goes with you. I hope that I have ruined, as many of my students will say, I hope I have ruined your movie making experience. I hope that you never again see a film and don't think about editing or cinematography. I hope that you always are in the theater going, hmm, what an interesting camera shot, or well, that was an interesting use of Foley. I hope that you're paying attention to the score. I hope that you're always paying attention to the performances, but that's not the only thing that you're paying, paying attention to, that you're looking at the mise-en-scene the costumes, the sets, you're looking at the whole picture and that when you leave a movie that had an incredible set design and someone says, how was the movie? You don't just say, it sucked because it didn't work for you, but that you say, it wasn't really my kind of film, but the set designs were amazing.